We are coming now to our fifth keynote that is uh, focusing on the preservation of natural resources through space. And we are proud and honored to welcome here Dr. Günther Schreier, Deputy Director of the German Remote Sensing Data Center at the Earth Observation Center of the German Aerospace Center, DLR. We had this before three times center. Dr. Schreier is coordinator for large-scale projects, especially in the context of the European Earth Observation System Copernicus and Earth Observation Projects with international partners. He is the German representative of the ESA Ground Segment Coordination Body and member of several other Copernicus-related committees and expert teams. He was active member of CEO's uh, working group ISS, IGBP, DIS, ISY, so uh, many different, uh, different bodies and other international committees. He was involved in projects like uh, CEO's Information Locator System, Global Land 1 km base elevation, uh, Global Change Video, and others. Currently, he is the chairman of the IEF Earth Observation Committee, and yeah, that's the most important. Uh, and chairman of the International Policy Advisory Group of ISPRS. And please give a, a warm welcome to Dr. Schreier. Um, I guess I'm the last keynote speaker for today. I was the first one uh, in the beginning of these two days. Um, and being the last of uh, two days, uh, there's a danger I replicate some of the fig figures and facts other speakers might have already mentioned to you. And uh, having already have had a talk at the beginning, I, there might be even the danger I replicate myself. So apologize to start with. Um, resources from space. We've heard a lot during the last two days about how Earth observation can help to find, to manage, to exploit, to better use our natural resources. And in this speech, I'd like to give you a little bit another twist on uh, view on the resources. It's not just about technology, maybe about us all and how we, uh, as a citizen, as a society, as technology, might better use our resources. In fact, um, what are resources good for and where come the resources? Resources come from our Earth. Do we have enough resources on our Earth to feed us all, to give all the raw material? The bitter truth is, and this is factoid, if we live and stay and continue to live as the average global citizen lives, it wouldn't be enough. So the latest figure is it needs 1.7 Earth, possibly if we behave as a global citizen the way we do now to get all the resources we need for our future. And this is the average, the OECD countries, Germany 3.2 Earth, USA 5.0 Earth, other countries of course, Brazil I had this 2 point, so even Brazil and other countries, there's a figure and you might go to the internet to find details figures for your countries. So the issue is we need not just to monitor resources, we need to keep track and better use our resources we have at hand. And the best resources we have are, of course, the renewable resources. This is just a figure, biotic, abiotic, renew, uh, renewable and non-renewable resources. Now, interesting is, um, fossil fuels, fossil refuse resources, they come from a decay of biotic material, forest, whatever biotic material, but unfortunately, this decay and turning this into oil or coal lasts hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, so fossil refuses are regarded as non-renewable resources. If they are gone, they are gone. They won't come back, so you have to have another earth or to have another technology to substitute them. I will concentrate on renewable resources and I will concentrate on food, water, air and energy. There are many more. But let me tell you what Earth observation can do and what are my very personal maybe observations on the use um, and underlined with some facts and figures I found. Starting with food. Now, there is, uh, during the last two years, and there was this other session about agriculture, 
it's obvious that Earth observation is the tool of choice to monitor, to manage, to look at our Earth, what food are you planting, is the crops in good health. In fact, the monitoring of agriculture gave birth to Earth observation of the Landsat series. We have the longest time series of vegetation coverage covered by uh, satellites. It will continue with other satellites. And many of the entrepreneurial satellites we have learned about during the two days here are targeting the agriculture market. And with the internet and all these now new tools and toys, you're really good in doing vegetation monitoring. So vegetation and food is a great thing. It has been done, it will be done, it will also give birth to new entrepreneurial ideas using Earth observation. You can use optical, you can use just a little bit promotion for DLR and tandem. You can use radar satellites. Radar is good for rice paddies, for instance. So rice paddy, looking through clouds and seeing flooded rice fields is an easy task. You can do with airborne polarization, polarization, radar polarization next to interferometry. Interferometry is exploited. Polarization is still kind of an unknown field. What the hell, or Sentinel one is polarized. What the hell does this polarization mean to me? What kind of food and what kind of crop is measured here? So this is a well-developed um, domain, and it goes without saying that this is a main target of many of the Earth observation programs and many of the activities we have followed up. The question is, when we go in depth, what food we are talking about and having in mind this 1.7 Earth we need possibly to feed us out. Um, there is a uh, researcher from Paraguay working for DLR with our center, and uh, together with the World Wildlife Fund, he had the target to just monitoring a region in Paraguay, but this is just everywhere in the world, between 2003 and 2013. So this is how the forest is gone. And we have also heard here from the lady in charge for the agriculture monitoring in Uruguay, most of this is then soy plantations. For this year, in Paraguay, maybe Uruguay, Brazil, everywhere in the world. Um, the figure is that, there are different figures, but I learned the figure that more than 85% of all soy, soy bean production is directly going to feed cattle worldwide, not just here. So the question is for sustainable living, um, what kind of food the global citizen should nourish on? Is it cattle? Is it crops or directly eating soybeans? Or shall we get as ugly and, and strange it sounds and first get these proteins from bugs in the future? You know that there are research and practical things ongoing. But the question is we have to feed seven plus billion people and they all wouldn't want to have a proper life. And also food production in linking all the sustainable development goals, safe food, safe climate, is directly linked to our climate change. We have heard here in the first row, Professor, I forgot his name, the sitting introduces to climate change. So also, also the way we produce our food is impacting climate change. And again, meat production, food production is not the best way to preserve and to, to have less CO2 footprint. Now, we could say, okay, I take this account, I pay uh, the money for my food, and I take into account the environmental effects, as long as I guarantee that the food which is being produced at the very beginning is also reaching my stomach. Unfortunately, this is not the case. There's a figure about 50% of all food being produced never reaches, not the customer, but your stomach. So, it depending where you are and which country you're looking, but the global figure produced and, and generated by FAO says if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after US and China. So again, the proper management of food, not just in the entire production chain, there are various figures how much food it doesn't even reach it to the market, though it's good, and look at yourself and also me, the food in your, how much food you're throwing away when it's in your refrigerator and run. So it's, it's a fact that, again, uh, food waste is an issue. And I don't think, maybe in some management aspect, Earth observation may help and could be of help. Water. You can survive without food, may some say not a day, but maybe several days. 
but you can't survive a few days without water. 60% or more of your body is water, so water is an issue. You could say, what's the problem? Uh, water, it's a blue planet, this uh, marble, blue marble, 60% of the uh, surface of the Earth is, is water, and uh, water is, it's a water planet. Um, unfortunately, if you're talking about the water, and here comes a short video, unfortunately, if you're talking about the water, it's not the water we can consume, but uh, as explained in the video done by some of my colleagues, it's only a fraction, 3% of all water is fresh water. And out of this 3%, it's glaciers, permafrost, ground water, surface water, and in the surface water, there is only a fraction, which is in these lakes and rivers you can use. I found a figure of 0.0007% of all water on Earth is just the water you can really drink. And I'm not talking about the water which comes from the tap, but also the water you might go in a fresh lake and drink directly. So, water is a scarce resource. We can monitor the sources of water. I go don't go into detail what kind of uh, nice toys and tools and, and satellite sensors we have. This is a work that colleagues of mine have done to show the global snow cover trend. The animation shows like going up and down and where we have less and, 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 and more snow cover in the world throughout the times as an indication, at least in our uh, region where I come from, snow is very important. The snow in Bavaria from the Alps is the source of fresh water uh, in Germany and other places. Um, and we use water and misuse water. This is just also a time series a colleague has done on uh, how fish farming is done in China. And this is a time series of 84, 95, 2004, 2014, and then this is the 2014 uh, Landsat scene. So this is linking the food and the water. Food uses water. So, food and water goes hand in hand, and how it's used, and how the resources are used. So, water is an issue. Uh, this is a global map showing you the countries stressed by water scarcity, World Resources Institute. Uh, I don't think it's just only political analysts say there is a danger that some countries go to water each other due to water, because they lack of water. So, water is a very hot political potato. And uh, water, it's not just in, in Sahara, and if you look, United States, this, this, uh, Spain, and other countries are also affected by scarcity of water. Um, the very much issue is also, uh, if the water is there, the water might even be polluted. Uh, I found the figure that uh, there are more deaths in the world currently due to bad water and bad sanitation than to any war currently ongoing in the world. So uh, the spoiled pollution of water, the scary sphere of sanitation, is a very, very big issue in the world, and it should be on the top ranks of the sustainable development goals. In some cases, again, I mentioned Earth observation can help, but Earth observation cannot do wonders and everything. Air. The air, the very tiny layer we have heard about around our blue marble, which protects us from the emptiness of space. Um, and this is fine, but we're just breathing in the very lower few hundred meters of air we live from. And we have, uh, in the recent air, as we also heard from the previous speaker, um, looking at the atmosphere was, from the very beginning, Tyros, the very first Earth observation satellite, so to say, was always an issue. And, and this is now operation. We have weather satellites. Thanks to weather satellites, we have a weather forecast, which is like a week or two, very reliable. And about two decades ago, we are also looking in detail with low Earth observation satellites and others to the composition, to the atmospheric composition of the Earth. And I won't tell all these um, satellites, uh, the Copernicus mission and system has a long two, satellite four and five, to look into the very detailed composition of all these trace gases. The issue is what air and the quality of air. And here's another global map of the particulate matter concentration, the dust and this, the stuff which comes from, from smoke. And um, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, who produced this map, also has just recently, as in the last month, produced these figures that 95% of all people, so 
all of us, live in areas where in principle WHO says you shouldn't live there exceeding the outline, the outside guideline, and 60%, the majority of people even um, have severe, should have severe problems. It's mostly in cities or if you live in near industrial sites, uh, maybe only some mountaineers or farmers up in the very high mountains uh, have maybe the uh, luck to live in air which is not polluted by this kind of stuff. And uh, particle matters are mostly generated by combustion, by by fuel, by burning something, and this goes hand in hand, amongst others, also with NO2. And this is the human footprint of NO2, so you can tell the sources, it's mainly production, it's uh, fossil fuel, fuel burning, and you see the hotspots of the world uh, as observed from space. And um, with Sentinel-5, so this is about, about, about the resolution, GOMA has about the resolution 80 times 80 kilometer, and here is now the new Sentinel-5 precursor, which gives now a resolution of about 3.5.7 kilometers. So we have a hundred times better resolution, and this gives us now a better way to monitor these kind of pollutant and, and this kind of, of trace gases, which are not necessarily good for our health. And we can look into time series. We look into different cities. This is Dhaka in Africa. And uh, these cities are exploding, they are growing, but the infrastructure, they're still burning wood, they are, don't keep track with their transportation system, so without any wonder, uh, the NO2 goes up over time. And other cities, like Los Angeles, if you look at this, um, and it's not only due to uh, uh, electric cars, I would say, not only to Tesla, that, that's just going down, it uh, has some other effects, uh, more efficient use of energy and others here. So the global trend is that there are some areas in the world which still go badly and some areas in the world are improving. And again, with new sensors you can go really to the street level, kind of the street level, very high resolution. And the issue is the trend. We have to have first observation data over a long time series. Otherwise, you always have a snapshot, and if you use, make science, you say it's a snapshot, it's worth nothing. You need to see the trend over the science. <coughs> Energy. Energy is another important factor, um, and also is linked to the other three air, of course, air pollution energy, food, and water. The question is also what energy, and I'm also con only concentrating here on renewable energy. And here also the most recent factor as of this month from IRENA, it's the International Renewable Energy Agency, I guess it's in Dubai or Abu Dhabi in, in um, So they say not a bad figure is that by 2015, it might be even higher now, 17.5% of the total energy is from renewable resources. Great. But it's only half of this which is really the renewable we normally think of, hydro, solar, and wind. The rest, 9.6%, is just that the cooking is done on wood, especially in developing countries. So this is also called renewable resources because it's wood. And this is, again, with health and food is linked because 42% uh, of all people on the world rely on fire wood cooking. And I, I don't mention all the barbecue and the nice stuff you do here also <laughs> in Uruguay, this is tradition. But um, it's also that using this kind of fires, the cook is affected, and the cook means often the women cooking in Africa and Asia that are affected by pollutants and particle matters in doing so. And um, this is not the right use, I would say, of renewable energy. IRENA has also produced the global figures on renewable energy, so this is just the renewable energy part. You see that, of course, luckily hydropower, uh, followed by uh, wind, the light blue, and followed by this grayish or purple flesh part of this solar. So this is the global figures, it's increasing, it's good, dominated by uh, hydro. If you now go, and this is all available on the ARENA website, to go to South America, this is the figure for South America, without any uh, wonder, it's hydropower which is dominating the renewable energy in South America. But you also see that, yeah, you have some more capacity possibly to develop on wind and specifically on 
macht solar power. So solar power is relative to the rest of the world underdeveloped. I haven't seen solar panels in Montevideo, for instance. So room for improvement. Um, and solar energy is, I mean, the direct way. You have heard the source of all energy is finally the sun. So it's the most direct way to harvest the sun because other, any other way is just well, wind, etc. It's just an indirect effect of, of the solar radiation we get. And of course you can estimate and optimize the position of uh, solar power in taking into account the cloud, the dust, the exposition. There have been plans uh, a couple of years ago in a big project, uh, Germany and German industry, to plan big, big solar uh, power plants in the Saharan desert. Unfortunately, they are gone. They are also a little bit biased by the political uproar in the northern African states, but also the industry lost a little bit of interest, I have to confess. But here again, this is used basically by Earth observation data, and if you go for high resolution Earth observation data, so this is what we have done for Munich. You can even go on a street or house level to optimize the use and the position of solar panels, solar uh, energy panels. And if you even go with an airplane, we heard about 8 centimeter resolution, you can map and monitor even like here, you have one roof which is covered with solar panels. So uh, any kind of observation is good to optimize the use of solar energy. Wind is another important issue. Uh, so Earth observation can be used. I, in my introductory talk, I talked about uh, maritime awareness and security using radar. This is not just uh, detecting ships and polluting ships, but also in monitoring the offshore wind farms. Um, they are far away from being optimally positioned. You see on the traces, you see in radar that one turbine is covering the other, depending on the wind and position. So this also gives rates of optimization. And the downside of both wind and solar, they are not available 24 hours. So the important issue of the electricity grid is when do I have it? When do I switch from one to the other? So they need to know a little bit in advance, a couple of hours, at least a couple of minutes in advance to optimize the yield of renewable energy. So we went through uh, food, energy, water quality and air quality and you have seen and I think I have told you that yes earth observation is the tool of choice to do this and measurements and facts to generate measurements and facts on a global basis on a continuous basis and with most of the program also on a free and open basis but I think I've also given a little bit food for thought on that earth observation is great but in achieving sustainable development goals and managing our renewable resources, we have to be very careful and also take other measures. Thank you very much.